Welcome back to this tutorial on Click Team Fusion 2.5 and how to use it to make a platform game. If you haven't watched the part one tutorial, you need to go back and watch that. And once you've done that, this part two of the tutorial will make a lot more sense to you. So please go do that and then come back to watch this video. So it's time now to jump in and make this mosquito so he can fly on his own, controlled by the computer, and so that there's some consequences to that. We're also gonna do some scrolling and we're gonna go and create a welcome screen as well. So let's jump in. So the first thing we need to do is make it so this mosquito can fly on its own. When I click on the mosquito, notice that it gives me properties here at the left. And I'm gonna to go to the man that's running. That makes some sense, right? That's movement. And I wanna make this character move. When I go there, Right now, he has static movement. Well, that doesn't sound like much of a movement at all. So I'm gonna go and change from static to one of these other options. And the easiest one, really, to use for enemies is a path. So I'm gonna click on path. Now he has path movement. But I have to establish what that path is. So I'm gonna click here where it says edit movement, edit. And this lets me give the mosquito a path to follow. And you use this tape mouse to do it. Now there's harder ways. If you want to do it in a harder way, you can. But I'm just going to go here to click tape mouse. And now look what it did. It put a little line that's attached to my mouse pointer and it's attached to the mosquito. And I'm just going to move that where I want it to be and then I'll right click. Now the first time you do that, it breaks the connection. But now if you right click on that square again, and choose draw a line. Now from that point on, you can just right click and right click and right click. It just lets you repeatedly right click. And so what I'm doing now is I'm creating the path that this mosquito will follow. And some of you are thinking, well, this is not AI. This is not artificial intelligence. And you're, you're right, of course. This is an easy way to create an enemy and give that enemy a movement, right? It is possible to create AI-controlled computer characters, but that's beyond the scope of this tutorial. I've done it before, but uh, like I say, it's beyond the scope of this tutorial. All right, so that's a pretty good, probably too complicated of a movement for this mosquito, but it will make it fairly challenging, I guess, for the hedgehog. So I'm gonna go down and click. This time I'm gonna left click, okay? That signifies that this is the last leg of the path. I'm not going to add any more. If I change my mind though, I could right click and continue to draw lines. Now, up here at the top, before I click OK and lock that in, there's a couple things I should do. One is I should try the movement. So I'll click that and you can see that there goes the mosquito going just where I told it to go and it's looking good. Okay, so I'm going to go and X out of this try movement um, window that I had open couple of things I want to do. You might want to speed up the mosquito. You might want to slow down the mosquito. Okay, it was at 50, I believe. So I'm going to stick with something close to 50. The other thing, you'll notice at the end of this path, the mosquito just stops. And that's not realistic. That's not good. So I'm going to go here where it says loop the movement. And I want it to reverse at the end. Both of these are important. So when the mosquito gets to the very end, he'll just retrace his steps. That's this one reverse at the end, and then when he gets back to the very beginning, I want him to loop. In other words, do the whole process over again. Okay, so those are both very important. So is speed. I'm gonna click OK. I'm satisfied that that mosquito now is ready to go. But now, what happens when Spyco collides with the mosquito? Right now, there would be no consequence. Nothing would happen at all. Let's go into the third button, the event editor, to make some consequences for when they collide. And I bet you can figure out what I'm gonna do here. I'll right click on new condition, and I'll say to myself, if the hedgehog, and I just right clicked on the hedgehog, collides with another object, and it's the mosquito, click okay. Now incidentally, I could have reversed those and said if the mosquito collides with the hedgehog, it doesn't matter. Then what do I want to have happen? First of all, I would add a sound effect if I had one. And again, I could go out on the internet and search and find a sound effect, but just know I could right click there, choose samples, play sample, and then I could load a file. Just clicking browse, I could just go in and choose an audio clip to be the sample that plays. In this case, I don't have one at the ready, 
So instead, what I'll have happen is I'll just have the hedgehog die. Okay, so I'll right click underneath the hedgehog and I'll choose destroy. Now at the same time, I could subtract points from player one, but in this case, I think I'll leave the points alone and instead I will subtract from the number of lives. Okay, player one has just lost one life. And you can just click here on one or type it in on the keyboard and then just click OK. And let's run the frame, see what happens. I'm just going along playing great. And then I touch the crazy mosquito there and my hedgehog dies, but the game continues. Okay, now that's a problem, right? There's nothing I can do here. So let's fix that. Jumping back into the event editor, I need to make an event for when the hedgehog has been destroyed. So I'm going to right click where it says new condition, right click on the hedgehog and go to pick or count. And there's an option here for have all hedgehog been destroyed. I'll click on that. The last hedgehog has been destroyed. If that's the case, I want to create a new hedgehog. So up here, there's something that looks like a cube and that stands for create new objects. So create a new object, a new what? A new hedgehog. Click OK. It wants to know where to create that hedgehog. And I'm going to say right here. So I just click and that's where the hedgehog will reappear and he'll drop down into the level. So I'll click OK. Let's try it out. Okay, I'm playing along. I touch the mosquito. Notice what happened. I'm down to two lives and the hedgehog was recreated. Uh, he just so happened to get uh, attacked again by the mosquito, so now he's down to zero lives. So incidentally, what I would do at this point is I would go here to new condition, right click, and right click on player one and say when the number of lives reaches zero, then what do I want to have happen? When the number of lives reach zero, I need to basically end the game, right? So I'm going to go here. This symbol here represents storyboard controls. Remember, this is the storyboard editor. But I can control some of that storyboard from within the event editor. So in here, I'm going to say when his lives reach zero, then I want you to jump to a certain frame. And it's going to be the game over frame. Now in this case, I only have two frames. I don't, I don't even have a frame yet for game over. So I'm going to use a calculation. Normally I would create, you know, a 10 or, or 20 level game. But for the sake of this tutorial not being too long, I'll just create a two level game and it's going to have a welcome screen at the beginning and an end game over screen at the end. So that means game over should be screen four or frame four. So I'll click use a calculation, type in the number four, click OK. And so when the number of lives reaches, reaches zero, jump to frame four, which is the game over screen. Okay, awesome. I'm going to go back into the second button and now I want to make it so that when the player achieves both goals of getting both of these objects, then he's advanced to level two. So to do this, I'm going to go into that third button to the event editor and I'll make a new condition. I'll right click on the five leaf clover and I'll say pick or count. Have all of them been destroyed? Yes. But I also want to test to see if all of the hearts have been destroyed. So I'll right click on the same line, number eight, and I'll add a new condition. And I want to test to see if these bonus hearts have also all been destroyed. Okay, so if both of those things are true, then I want to jump to frame number, not four, but three. But I'm just going to click and drag that check mark down and then I'll right click edit and change it to three. So you can see how that's a little bit of a shortcut. Okay, so I think I am done with level two. I'm going to jump out to the storyboard editor and I think I'm ready now to make frame three, which is level two, and frame four, which is the game over screen. Now to do this, I could click and, you know, create from scratch the hedgehog again and I could put the ground on there again but in many cases you can save a lot of time and effort just by right clicking on the level that you just completed and by choosing clone. So that's going to clone it. I now have two levels that look identical and act identically. All of the events that I put into this level here are also going to be here. Okay, But now I can just double click to jump into this and I can alter it. One simple thing I could do is I could go into level two, it's really level two, and I could click and change the background color. 
Okay, so now it's going to be a little bit uh, different experience, a different background color. Now you notice that they're both called level one. That's probably going to be a problem. So I'm going to go here to the storyboard editor. I can go in and I can name this level two just so I don't get confused. And now I can jump back in and make some other changes. Now the other major change I want to do is I want to make it so that this level two is actually scrollable so that the player isn't confined just to this 800 by 600 area. I want to extend it off to the right. So to do this, I could go back to the first button and I could make it longer. Okay, this is the X value, 800. And I think I'll go ahead and do that. I'll make it 900, hit enter. Now when I jump back in, you can see it is longer. It's wider slightly. There is another way to make the same change though. I could go here to the left in the workspace toolbar, click on level two, and notice it's now 900 by 600, and I could click to make it maybe 1280 and hit enter. And so that's a different way to do the same thing, okay? So now that I've done that, give me a few minutes here. I would like to dress up this level, make it a little different, a little more exciting. And I'm going to use the same skills I showed in part one of this video tutorial. I'm going to be uh, copying some of these, cloning them by right clicking, not cloning, actually duplicating. So I'll duplicate a bunch of these plots of ground and I'll organize them, click and drag and put them on the screen the way I want them to be. I might add some more clovers and hearts and things. And then I'll come back and when we resume, I'll show you how to add scrolling to your games. Okay, I'm back. And you'll notice what I did. I just extended the graphics off to the right. After changing the dimensions of the level, I just duplicated these plots of ground off to the side. I also added some more graphics here. And I duplicated, not cloned, but duplicated. And it's very important, the difference. I duplicated this clover. You can see that they're both called bonus four, and that's because I duplicated it. The nice thing about that is I didn't have to go back and reprogram and recode everything for a second clover. Because I duplicated, they are the exact same thing, just twice. Same with the hearts. These are all bonus one hearts. If I had cloned, it would be bonus one, bonus two, bonus three, bonus four, and I would have quadrupled the amount of work I had to do. Okay, so I am ready now to play this level but watch what happens when I run the frame and I'm gonna go full screen on this. You can see I can go up, I can get the different things and, uh, but when I go off screen, even though the level continues, you can see my hedgehog is not falling, but even though the level continues, the camera is not following. So there's no scrolling happening to follow my hedgehog. So to solve this, I'm going to X out of this game test basically to get back to this screen and now what I need to do is I need to go to the third button to get into the events editor and I want to go to where it says new condition. I'll right click and I want to set up a code something along the lines of follow the hedgehog. Now remember you usually start with if in your head you say the word if but in this case when do I want it to follow the hedgehog? If something happens? No, I want it to always follow the hedgehog and so there's got to be something here for always and there is. You can see all my different characters here. So this represents player one. This is the keyboard and the mouse. This is to create new objects. This is timer, storyboard controls, and sound. And then we have special. This is basically miscellaneous. I'm gonna go into the miscellaneous and look, when I right click on it, right at the top it says always. And then I want to go to storyboard controls. Okay, and I wanna always, so I'll right click there. I had to right click a couple of times to make it work. But look at that, one of the options underneath the storyboard controls is scrolling's center window position in frame. Now, I've learned with trial and error that I should, instead of picking this, I should select horizontal position of window in frame. Otherwise, the screen bounces around too much. You can test it out if you don't believe me, but I'm gonna go here with center, the horizontal position of the window frame, and now it wants me to give it a number. Whatever number I put here, that's the pixel that it's gonna focus on and center on. Well, guess what? I don't wanna center it on a pixel. I wanna center it on this guy down here. So I'm gonna click on the hedgehog and then go down and select position. And is it the X coordinate of this animal, the hedgehog, or is it the Y coordinate? Well, if you think about it, it's the X coordinate. If it goes to the right, if it goes to the left, if you think of a graph, the X axis is the one that runs left and right. So I'm gonna select X coordinate, click OK. Now I go up and click Run Frame 
Now, let's see if I did it right. I can advance, I can click shift to jump, and look, look at that, beautiful scrolling. My hedgehog is being followed by the camera, basically. The camera is staying focused on the hedgehog. Look, I still can't go off screen, but this is just fantastic and very easily done. And uh, if I didn't talk so much, I could very quickly have set this up. I've got a scrolling game that looks good and is fun. Okay, I'm going to X out of that because in the time remaining, we need to look at how to end the game and how to start the game. Okay, I kind of saved those two pretty important things for last. And let's go first to starting the game. Okay, this is that welcome screen that I kept alluding to. It's frame one, but I'm going to rename it to welcome and title screen. Okay, so this is what the player is going to see first when they first start up the game. I'm going to double click on that and it takes me to the frame. Um, this is the frame editor and I can design now a welcome screen. So maybe the first thing I'll do is I'll put in some color. Okay, so I'm going to find the welcome screen here at the left in the workspace toolbar. There it is, welcome and title screen. I'll pick a color. Now, you don't have to just throw a color up there. If you have graphics that you want to use, you can use them. You can import them in as a backdrop by double clicking on the background, going to background, selecting backdrop. It gives you just a blank backdrop, but then you can double click on it and draw a backdrop or you can import a backdrop from your computer. So it is possible to bring in your own graphics. But in this case, that's not what I want. I just want to put one color on the background. Now I would like to have a picture of the hedgehog, right? He's the star of the show. So I'm gonna go down here to my library, remember in the miscellaneous, in the game section, and I'll just select that hedgehog, drag him on the screen. But if you remember, this hedgehog is controllable by the player. And on the welcome screen, I don't really want that to be the case. So after shrinking that little bottom window there, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna make this hedgehog nice and big, okay? Maybe that's too big, he's pixelated a little bit. But anyway, I want them to be able to see the star of the show. But then I'm gonna go here and go to movement and I'm gonna change it from eight directions to static. So this is just gonna be a character that just sits there. Now I'd really like the hedgehog to be centered perfectly. Okay, and I wish that there were guidelines that could show me what the perfect center is, but there's actually something almost better. And what that is, is you can right click on anything in Click Team Fusion and choose Align in Frame, Horizontal Center. You can also do it again, right click, Align in Frame, Vertical Center, and that is the perfect center now of the screen. Okay, great. Next, I can put in some text. I want it to say Spico the Hedgehog, right? That's the name of the game. And to do that, I'm just gonna go up here, double click on a blank part of the screen, and I'm gonna go down and look for a type of object called text. And there's five different text objects. If you're a teacher, take a look at this one. There's one called question and answer. There's also a quiz object. These are great for teachers. You can create your own fantastic educational games using Click Team Fusion. I've made maybe 30 of these for my students to play, and it's a great way for them to practice and to learn the content of the class. So those are awesome. But for right now, I'm just gonna go to either string or formatted text. In this case, I guess I'll just go with string. So I'll just click on there, I'll click on the background. Now I double click on the word text, and I can change it. I'll call this Spico the Hedgehog. And you can see it's kind of small, but if I click on it, you'll notice up here at the top of the screen, there are some font options, and one of them is font size. So I can click on the font size, and it's not just size, actually. You can pick the style that you want, and there's not a whole lot. You can install more if you would like to, but I'm just gonna go with a few of these options. I'll make it bigger, click OK, and there it is. Looks beautiful, right? No, it doesn't. And the reason why is because my text box is too small. So I just clicked and dragged to resize that text box. It looks a lot better. I can also highlight my text and choose to center the text. And that's nice because now I can right click and align the whole text box in the frame horizontally. And this is looking a lot better. Now, if this were a real game that I was gonna use with my students or publish, I would decorate this a little better, make it look a lot nicer. But for now, I'm just gonna stick with that as far as decoration is concerned. And now I'm gonna put in some functional buttons. So I'm gonna double click on the background and go down to interface. And you can see that one of the interface options is button. I double clicked on it. Now I'm gonna click on the screen to put 
the button on the screen. Okay, there it is. I'm going to double click on it now and type in the word start. Okay, so that button is going to start the game. And then I'm going to right click on the button and choose not duplicate because then I'd have two start buttons. Instead, I'll choose clone object. Click OK. But this one, instead of being called start, is going to be called quit. Now, if I wanted to, I could change up what these look like. I could change other properties regarding these buttons. To do that, I would click on the button and use this properties window here at the left to make changes. Okay, but for now, that's pretty good. Now, let's play the game. This time, instead of run frame, I could do run application. Why? Because this is frame one. So I click on it, it starts up. This is awesome, I'm excited to play. I click start, nothing happens. The reason why? because we're programming here, we're coding, and you have to tell the computer basically everything that you want to have happen. So I'm going to go in here to the third button, the event editor, to actually do that. I'll right click on new condition, and my if statement is something like, if the player clicks on the button, then start the game, right? That's kind of what I'm going for. So I say the word if to myself, the button, which button? I should have named these buttons, that would have helped. But button one is probably the start button, so I'll right click on it, and I'll go down to button clicked. So if the start button is clicked, what do I want to have happen? I want it to go to the next frame. So that's probably a storyboard control. It is. So I right click and sometimes you have to click that twice for some reason. Now I can select next frame. Now that would work beautifully. But if you want, if you prefer, you could choose jump to frame and then it lets you pick which one, right? And it's the next frame. So either one of those would have worked great. I click OK and now that's a functional button. Next, I want to create a similar thing for the quit button, but this time the button is going to end the game. Now, I have found that if there's a line that I'm about to make that's going to be similar to the one above, sometimes it's best, instead of creating it from scratch, it's best to click on the number of the one above, drag down, let go, and it duplicates it, and then you can double click to switch to a different button. Okay, so I'm going to switch it to button two. If button two is clicked, Okay, button two is end the game or quit the game. So this time, this check mark doesn't really help me. So I'm gonna right click on it and I'm gonna delete that. And I'm gonna right click again, but this time I'll say end the application. So let's try it out. I'll click run application. Let's see if it's working. First of all, I can't control the hedgehog. I use the arrow keys, nothing happens. That's because I changed it to be a static object. I click start and look, the game starts. This is awesome, okay. Working buttons. Doesn't seem amazing, but if any of you have ever tried programming something and tried putting in working buttons, I mean, you can do that in PowerPoint, but it usually takes some effort and work. But to be able to do this so easily in Click Team Fusion is amazing. Okay, I'm gonna run it again, the application, but this time I'll click quit and you'll see the game just ends. So this is working fantastically. In fact, I'm done with my welcome screen. I'm done with level one. I'm done with level two. Now it's on to frame number four. It looks like it's called frame three, but it's actually frame number four, one, two, three, four. And I'll call this game over, okay? So now I'll just jump in there, give it a background color using this workspace toolbar. I can just select frame four or game over. Background color, how about black? And then I can just simply put in some text that says game over and then I can have a button to go back to the home screen. So give me just a second to put those elements in and then I'll resume. Okay, I'm back, I'm ready to go. I put in, you can see the text at this time in red. Now to change the color, I had to type in the words and then click on it and then go here to use this tool to change the color. Otherwise it wouldn't have been visible with the black background. I also put in this button, made it bigger by clicking on the corner, and I also made the text bigger using this font tool. I also made this button work here using the third button, and I made it so when it's clicked, it restarts the application. The whole game is restarted. All right. Now, the only other element I'd like to add to this last screen, the game over screen, is I'd like to add a high score table. To do that, I just double click on the blank background. I can go in and look for games, and you can see there's an option for high score. Click OK, or I could have double clicked on it. I click on the background, and I'm gonna have to change the color so it's visible. So there is a high score table that I can use to reward students who do well and have a goal for people. They wanna try to beat the high score. 
Okay, so I can just arrange that the way I want it to be. Maybe I'll right click on it, choose align in frame, horizontal center. That makes it perfectly centered. And let's see if it works now. I'm gonna run my application from the beginning. So I'll click start and I'll jump, get the clover, get the heart. And look, when I got both of those things, it was supposed to have taken me to level two. But this is something I didn't test out, if you remember. I just assumed it would work and I was wrong. Okay, now this is actually one of the things I love most about Click Team Fusion, is this is a way for students to learn about debugging and about problem solving and critical thinking and stuff like that. So we need to troubleshoot this. So I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna click on the third button to look at our code. If you remember, our code says the last clover's been destroyed and the last heart's been destroyed. If so, jump to frame three. Now I can already see what the flaw is in this. And that is that this is testing at the moment of destruction, okay? So at the moment that this clover is destroyed, the heart hasn't also been destroyed. And when the heart has been destroyed, the clover was destroyed seconds earlier, right? And so it's never simultaneously true that both of these things have just happened. So I need to replace this with something better. I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna right click on the clover and I'm gonna go down to pick or count, but instead of saying have all of them been destroyed, I'm gonna to compare to the number of those objects. And I'm gonna say, is it equal to zero? Okay, so the number of clovers is equal to zero and the number of hearts is equal to zero. So I'm gonna right click on the nine and I'll say add a new condition. And this time it's gonna be the hearts. I right click, pick or count compared to the number of the hearts, and it's also equal to zero. If both of those things are true, I wanna to jump to frame number three, okay? We don't need this one now, because I'm confident that this new one is gonna work. So now let's try it out, run application, start, and now it works. Now, is it gonna work on this particular level? No, so I should fix this level as well, and in fact, I'll do that. So give me a second to fix that. Now let me show you one of the best ways to fix that. What you would do is you can right click and copy the entire line, okay? Now I can jump to level two. I could go back here, select level two, go into the third button, and I'll try right clicking on the number 10 and paste. And look, it just copy pasted from one level to the next, and I've deleted out the bad line that wasn't really helping me. Okay, so, I know we just tried this out, but let me try it again. We're gonna get the, the different objects that make it so we can get to the next level. If I can avoid that uh, terrible mosquito. Oh, game over. That's okay. It took me to the last screen and it gives me the chance to put my name in there. Okay, I'll just put Charles in there. Click okay. There's my score. And uh, that score has been recorded now as one of the best scores. To be honest with you, this game is really not completely finished, but in general, I basically have two playable levels. I've got a welcome screen and a game over screen. In order to really finish it off, I probably should have here in level two, in the event editor, I should have gone in and said, once those have reached zero, I need to not jump to frame number three, but I need to jump to the next frame, frame number four. Okay, so I should go in and I should delete the frame number three. So that was a mistake. And I'm sure there's other small mistakes that are in here, but for the most part, I have now a four frame or four screen game with two levels, and I could so easily make another 50 levels or much more using Click Team Fusion. So now that I have this game, it's finished, let's say. What do I do so that other people can play it? Well, what you do is you go up here to File, and you go to Build. And I can build this into an application that can be played by others. So I'll do that, and notice that there's an option for a standalone application. Now, in the free version of Click Team Fusion, I don't believe that you have this option. This is for paying customers, but the free version, it should let you save it as an HTML5 project and uh, build it out that way. For those of you that do have the paid version, I'm just gonna go in, choose Build Application. It takes me to this screen here, and I wanna save it to the desktop. I'll call this Spico the Hedgehog. Click Save. 
it's compiling it all together. And now if I minimize that, you'll see on my desktop, I have a game called Spikle the Hedgehog. Now everything about this can be edited if I want to. Using Click Team Fusion, I could change this icon. It doesn't have to be the Thunderbolt every time. But this is an exe file that can run on any modern Windows computer. You can see it's almost 11 megabytes, so that's really not that big. I could even upload this to the internet for people to download and play on their own computers. I could put this on a CD. Uh, there's really a lot of different ways that I could get this to other people so that they could play this game. So I hope you enjoyed watching these two tutorials. I know that they're both kind of long tutorials, much longer than I typically like to make, but Click Team Fusion really is one of my all-time favorite programs. I think it's a wonderful piece of software. It enables teachers and students and anyone really to create their own software. You can use your imagination and make games, make applications, make all sorts of tools and great things that you can use. So thanks for watching and Please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel for more videos about technology for teachers and students and look for a new video every Monday.